The first thing you lose is the sky. One second there's blue, sunlight, maybe a few lazy clouds, and the next, everything above you turns into moving darkness. Not a storm cloud, not smoke. Something with ribs, something with muscles, something that keeps going until your neck starts to complain. Right above your head, a belly the size of a house glides past, carried on four pillar-thick legs that thump the ground like slow drums. Far ahead, a tiny head calmly strips leaves from the treetops like this is just another Tuesday. Far behind, a tail as long as a city bus drifts by, whip thin at the tip, swaying lazily. Hmm, yeah, you haven't just walked under a dinosaur, you've walked under a moving bridge. Meet Diplodocus, the breathing, eating, walking bridge of the Jurassic. And for the next few minutes, you're walking underneath it. 150 million years ago, planet Earth looked nothing like the blue marble we know today. The continents were still glued together in one giant landmass called Pangaea, but it was already starting to crack. In what would one day become the American West, vast rivers spilled across floodplains, laying down the rocks we now call the Morrison Formation. Fern prairies stretched for miles, broken by galleries of towering conifers and cycads. The air was warm, seasonally dry, and absolutely packed with giants. Out here, sauropods ruled. Brachiosaurus reached for the sky like a skyscraper with a neck. Stegosaurus clanked past in plated armor. Allosaurus prowled the riverbanks looking for dinner. And then there were the Diplodocus, lots of them. If Brachiosaurus was the high rise of the sauropod world, Diplodocus was the six lane freeway lying flat, 25, maybe 27 meters, from nose to tail tip 80 to 90 feet of dinosaur. Longer than a tennis court, longer than two London buses parked end to end. But here's the twist. It didn't weigh anywhere near as much as you'd expect. 10, 12, maybe 15 tons, slender for its length. Nature went for long and elegant rather than short and chunky with this one. The name Diplodocus means double beam because under each tail vertebra there are two little chevron bones that act like suspension struts. Clever engineering, straight from nature's drawing board. The neck alone could be around 12 meters long, made of hollow, air-filled bones so light that modern birds still use the same trick. At the end of that crane boom neck sat a small, light skull with a battery of peg-shaped teeth, perfect for stripping, terrible for chewing. And the tail? Ah, the tail. Fifty, sometimes eighty vertebrae tapering down to a whip so thin you could probably tie a bow with it if you were feeling particularly reckless. Scientists used to think that tail dragged on the ground, leaving those long furrows we see in fossils. Turns out, no. Trackways with no drag marks show it floated above the dirt, ready to flick away anything foolish enough to sneak up from behind. From a distance, the whole animal looks like one absurd, continuous line. Picture the scene at dawn. Mist hangs over a dried-up riverbed. One by one, huge shapes appear out of the haze, moving in a slow, orderly line. From the air, they look like a freight train made of meat. A long column of bodies strung out along the floodplain, Perfectly spaced, heads swaying gently as they harvest low ferns and horsetails without even breaking stride. Their footprints huge, rounded, surprisingly shallow form two parallel tracks that stretch for hundreds of meters. Paleontologists have found these trackways in Colorado and Portugal. Real prehistoric traffic jams. So how do you keep a 30-meter animal from snapping in half the first time it does anything more dramatic than a gentle curve? Simple. You don't turn corners. Diplodocus was a straight-line feeding machine. The neck probably stayed mostly horizontal, sweeping in a wide arc from side to side. Instead of reaching high, it reached far skimming plant life from ground level, up to about four or five meters, while the body just kept rolling forward. Up front, peg-shaped teeth stripped leaves. Down below, a vast fermenting gut did the hard work of turning all that salad into fuel. From the side, the whole animal formed a long, low S-curve, balanced by that tail, so it could slide through the forest without toppling itself or the scenery. And speaking of biting, let's talk about that tail again for a second. 
Some researchers ran the numbers and think the thin end could have accelerated to incredible speeds, maybe even cracking like a bullwhip. Most experts today are more cautious, but even at modest speeds, getting smacked by a diplodocus tail would absolutely ruin your day. Imagine trying to mug the last carriage of a moving train, and the train decides to flick you into next week. Allosaurus probably learned to keep a respectful distance. Eventually, the freight train stopped running. Ecosystems changed, climates shifted, new species took over. Diplodocus sank into river mud and lake beds, its bones waiting quietly under sand and silt while the continents drifted and oceans opened. Fast forward to the present day. You walk into a grand museum hall, marble floors, echoing footsteps, and there it is, Dippy, or one of his many cloned siblings, stretched out in impossible glory. Casts of Diplodocus skeletons were the Victorian version of going viral. Industrialists shipped them to any city with a big enough room and a rich enough benefactor. Every mount reflects the science of its time. Tails dragging in the early 1900s, then proudly raised, necks swooping like swans, and later straightened as new fossils came in. The dinosaur that once walked the floodplains now walks through a century of human arguments about posture. And every time a kid stands under that towering spine and cranes their own neck upward, the same feeling hits. Awe. Pure and simple. Just for fun. Drop one adult Diplodocus into downtown Manhattan at rush hour. One animal, 25 meters nose to tail. The head pokes curiously into third floor windows. The tail stretches clear across the intersection. And suddenly four lanes of traffic are very, very polite. Traffic lights? Irrelevant. And feeding it would take hundreds of kilos of fresh foliage every single day, basically a city park per week for one gentle giant. Somewhere, an urban planner is quietly having a meltdown. But that's the magic of Diplodocus. It wasn't the tallest, wasn't the heaviest, wasn't the fiercest. It was simply the longest continuous living thing most ecosystems had ever seen. A moving corridor of flesh and bone that smaller animals sheltered beneath, that reshaped rivers just by walking through them, that turned entire floodplains into highways of footprints. It connected the ground to the canopy, the wet season to the dry, the past to whatever poor paleontologist had to puzzle out how the hell something that big stayed upright for 70 years. Today, those bones lie silent under glass and spotlights. But every time we stand beneath them, Every time a child reaches out to touch a plaster toe the size of a beach ball, we're doing exactly what tiny Jurassic mammals once did. Walking under the breathing bridge, looking up in wonder at a world so vast we can barely fit it in one glance. So here we are, 150 million years later, still following in its footprints. If this gentle giant made you feel even a fraction of that same awe, do me a favor. Hit that like button so more people can walk under the bridge with us. Drop a comment telling me which dinosaur you want to meet next. I'm already warming up my best terrifying chicken impressions for the theropods. And subscribe. Because next time we're leaving these living freeways behind and heading somewhere a little faster, a little toothier, a lot louder. See you in the Cretaceous. Try not to stand behind the tail.